This video is a whistle-stop tour of the electrochemistry topic in AQA A-level chemistry. I've explained things very quickly and without practice questions, so if you need more detail or some practice for yourself, be sure to check out the videos in the full playlist. However, if you want one last minute cram before your end of topic test or just before your A-level exams, then this may be the video for you. Electrochemical cells, also known as gabalic or voltaic cells, are made of two half cells. A half cell is a structure that contains a conductive electrode and a surrounding conductive electrolyte. It isn't possible to measure the potential of a half cell, so half cells need to be examined in pairs and their potential difference calculated. In a cell with two metal-based half cells, electrons will flow from the more reactive metal to the less reactive metal, and we can use electrochemical cells to explain and predict redox reactions. You know from GCSE that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. And you should remember that oxidation always happens at the anode and reduction always happens at the cathode. Please note this is not electrolysis and therefore the charge of the electrodes is reversed compared to that. The most classic example of an electrochemical cell is the Daniell cell. This is made from a zinc half cell connected to a copper half cell by a wire, and through that wire electrons will flow from the more reactive zinc to the less reactive copper. In order to balance this change in charge, the free ions are going to move through the salt bridge, which is a piece of filter paper soaked in an inert solution like potassium nitrate or maybe sodium nitrate. Oxidation will happen at the anode where zinc loses electrons, and reduction will happen at the cathode where copper gains electrons. When deducing the potential of a half cell, we need to compare it to something, and this could either be the standard hydrogen electrode or another half cell that we already know the potential of. Fundamentally, we're looking at an equilibrium, so the conditions need to be standardised, otherwise this would affect the position of equilibrium. We usually think in terms of 298 Kelvin, and if the half cell involves a solution, that solution should have a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed, and if gases are involved, then 100 kilopascals. The standard potential for a half cell tells you about the tendency of a species to accept electrons and therefore its effectiveness as an oxidizing or reducing agent. We can use this in order to figure out whether a chemical reaction will happen spontaneously. If we want to form an electrochemical cell or make a prediction about a redox reaction, then one of these reduction potentials is going to need to be turned around to make an oxidation potential. The rule is that we look at the E values and the equation that has the more positive E value will proceed in the forward direction, whereas the equation with the less positive E value, whether that's positive or negative, will be reversed. This then allows us to put together the two equations like so. A typical exam question will give us a list of reduction potentials and things that are themselves being reduced are good oxidising agents. So by looking for the most positive number, we can identify the most positive oxidising agent. Here, that's going to be for this equation, and therefore my most powerful oxidising agent would be the silver plus iron. Then my least powerful oxidising agent is going to be the least positive number. So in this instance, that would be barium 2 plus. If we're asked instead to identify the most powerful reducing agent, then we need to bear in mind that that's going to be something that is itself oxidised. So we're looking for species on the right hand side, not the left. And we're now looking for the most negative number. So here, for the most powerful reducing agent, I'm going to look at this equation, and what I'm going to say is that it's barium. Then the least powerful reducing agent will be the most positive number. So again, we're back looking at this silver equation, but this time we're picking something from the right-hand side, so that's going to be silver as opposed to the silver iron. An electrochemical cell made from two half cells can be represented by this conventional representation. In this, we use a double vertical line to represent the salt bridge, and then we use single vertical lines to represent phase boundaries, for instance, between these solid electrodes and these aqueous solutions. When deciding where to put the different species, we always put the most highly oxidized species nearest to the salt bridge. So in this instance, the solid metal electrodes are on the outside and the aqueous ions are on the inside. If I'm showing the representation for an electrochemical cell that is actually going to generate a potential difference, then my more positive E value is going to go on the right hand side. When the half cell itself doesn't consist of a solid metal electrode, I may need to use platinum as a phase boundary. If I have two different species that are in the same phase, for instance, two different ions in a redox electrode, I separate these with a comma. Remember, when you're assembling a conventional representation for two different equations, you need to keep the more positive one on the right hand side, and you also need to think about the oxidation state of the different species. 
The potential of any half cell can be identified by connecting it to the standard hydrogen electrode, which by definition has a potential of zero. This has to be measured under standard conditions, so hydrogen gas is pumped in at 100 kilopascals with a temperature of 298 Kelvin, with usually a one molar solution of hydrochloric acid or another source of hydrogen ions. Crucially, it's the hydrogen ions that need to be at one mole per decimeter cubed. These are connected via platinum black, which provides a reaction surface to allow for a transfer of electrons. By connecting a half cell to the standard hydrogen electrode under standard conditions, it's possible for us to measure the electromotive force, which is measured in volts. If an electrochemical cell is assembled not under standard conditions, then this will affect the size of the electromotive force measured. This is why it's possible to set up an electrochemical cell that contains two half cells containing the same species, if they have different concentrations. In addition to telling us about the utility of a particular chemical cell for generating electricity, calculating electromotive force also allows us to predict whether a redox reaction between two species would proceed. In order for copper to be displaced from solution, we need this first equation to run in the forward direction. In other words, the copper 2 plus ions must be reduced. A more powerful reducing agent is going to cause an E-value which is more negative than the value for copper here. So we look at the numbers that are less positive than plus 0.34. And based on that, we can say that zinc, nickel and tin are all more powerful reducing agents than copper. If the overall electromotive force for a cell is higher than zero, then that reaction is feasible. But if it's less than zero, then the reaction is not feasible. In the next tier of question, we're looking for species that can start a redox reaction, but not allow it to go all the way to completion. Here, we're looking for reducing agents. So we need to be looking at the right hand side of the table. And we have data for chloride ions, iron two plus ions and zinc. We're looking for something that is a powerful enough reducing agent to reduce dioxovanadium, but not so powerful that it also reduces oxovanadium-4. So if we look to start with at our chloride ions, these are too powerful of an oxidizing agent, so they're not going to be able to reduce the dioxovanadium ions. If we look at our zinc, then that's too powerful of a reducing agent. So while it would do that first reduction step, it would also continue to reduce this down to vanadium-3+. So then we've got our Goldilocks, which is iron 2 plus. Electrochemical cells can be split into three types. Firstly, we divide them into chemical cells and fuel cells. And then chemical cells can be divided further into reversible cells that you can recharge and irreversible cells, which you can't. In a chemical cell, the chemical reaction stops once one of the reactants has been used up. If it's a rechargeable cell, you then apply a big voltage to reverse the reaction and turn the products back into reactants so that you can use it again. But in an irreversible cell, that's not possible, usually because one of the products has then gone on to react further. In contrast to that, a fuel cell doesn't ever stop working because you're constantly supplying the reactants and so they're never going to run out in the first place. In the AQA A-level chemistry exams, there aren't named examples of non-rechargeable cells, but the most regularly used example is the classic Danielle cell. This isn't practical for a portable battery because it contains liquids that move around and could spill. The most common everyday cell is a zinc carbon cell. This has a zinc case functioning as the anode, and therefore the zinc loses electrons and over time it will wear away, causing the cell to split and leak, releasing the corrosive ammonium chloride electrolyte. The cathode is a central chamber containing manganese dioxide and powdered carbon. To allow the passage of charge into it, there's a graphite rod, and on top of this is a metal lid. The ammonium chloride electrolyte is a paste with water, and that's split up from the zinc casing by a porous membrane, which allows ions to move through, but not anything else. Over time, at the cathode, the second half equation takes place, which initially forms hydrogen gas, but this is quickly oxidised further by the manganese dioxide to become water, and this is why the cell isn't rechargeable. Sometimes you see the cell be slightly modified, so instead of using ammonium chloride, it uses zinc chloride, which generates a higher current and is also a longer life cell. Alkaline batteries were the named example of a non-rechargeable battery if you did AQA GCSE chemistry. And instead of having an acidic electrolyte like ammonium chloride, you have an alkaline electrolyte like potassium hydroxide. Lead acid cells are a classic example of a rechargeable cell, and they're the basis of car batteries. Usually six of them are wired together to make a battery with a potential difference of about 12 volts. The cell consists of two sheets of lead serving as electrodes, and the positive electrode is coated in lead oxide. Those two sheets are then dipped into sulfuric acid. At the negative anode, oxidation occurs and two electrons are lost from the lead when it reacts with the sulfate ions from the sulfuric acid. At the positive cathode, those electrons reduce the lead oxide with four hydrogen ions and sulfate ions to make lead sulfate and water. 
If those processes are combined, we get this overall equation. Remember that if the cell is recharged by applying a potential difference in the opposite direction, then these processes will run in reverse. Another example of a rechargeable cell is the lithium cell. Be aware that there are several different types, but AQA only asks you about one of them. Lithium cells are very light due to the low density of lithium. They have a solid electrolyte made from a polymer, which prevents leakage and the reaction of lithium with an aqueous electrolyte. The positive electrode is made from lithium cobalt oxide, and the negative electrode is made from carbon. These are sandwiched around the polymer electrolyte. At the negative anode, there's a surplus of electrons due to the oxidation of lithium. At the positive cathode, reduction occurs. You are expected to have memorized the half equations for the different electrodes. Be aware that these are listed in the specification in the correct direction. Unlike our normal system where we're given two different reduction potentials, here the first equation has already been flipped. So that means that I then add them together to find out what the lithium cell has a voltage of, which in this instance is four. Remember, if you're asked to give equations for recharging, you'll need to flip the half equations. You could also be asked to identify which species has undergone oxidation or reduction. The advantages of rechargeable cells are twofold. Disposing of cells is hard because they often contain toxic chemicals. Additionally, those electrolytes also contain metals that are in short supply. So by recharging and reusing the same cells, we minimize the need for mining more of these. In contrast to chemical cells, in a fuel cell, a potential difference is generated by the electrochemical oxidation of a fuel, usually hydrogen or sometimes methanol. That fuel is continuously supplied. This chemical oxidation significantly reduces energy losses when compared to direct combustion. Rather than reacting directly with oxygen, the fuel is oxidized to make cations. In the most common example, hydrogen gas is pumped in and then oxidized to make hydrogen ions and electrons. Any remaining hydrogen is just pumped out again. These electrons travel through a wire. At the cathode, oxygen reacts with water and also these electrons to make hydroxide ions. And these hydroxide ions then join up with the hydrogen ions to make water, which is the only waste product. You should know the half equations for either electrode, and you should be able to join these together by cancelling out the electrons in order to make one overall equation, which is just hydrogen plus oxygen reacts to make water. You may be asked to compare the use of hydrogen or methanol fuel cells to using chemical cells. The fuel cell uses a continuous process, whereas any chemical cell can run out of fuel as it's a batch process. With a rechargeable cell, each time you charge, it stores slightly less energy, and compared to a continuous process like a fuel cell, there's a reduction in efficiency. Oxidising hydrogen doesn't produce any toxic waste products or greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide. Part of the drive for developing rechargeable batteries is that lots of them have really toxic or corrosive chemicals in them, so the waste products may be toxic when it's time to finally get rid of them. Hydrogen is highly explosive and this can make it difficult to store and transport. Fuel cells have a relatively low potential difference and therefore it isn't feasible to use one single cell without making a battery. Thank you very much for watching and I hope that you found this a useful summary of the electrochemistry topic for AQA A-Level Chemistry. If you have, then don't forget to like and subscribe for more A-Level Chemistry content coming soon.